from generation to generation, right across this great land. Hymns of hope and healing have enabled the human spirit to rise out of tragedy with thanksgiving. This is the story of those hymns. The men who are working in the bottom of this pit, you don't hear a lot of sweet sounds, but amazing grace, how sweet the sounds. I never get tired of singing Amazing Grace, but the words, the message, without his amazing grace, uh, we couldn't survive. We wouldn't have hope, we wouldn't have peace. As the ashes were rising, so was this tremendous heart of compassion. War, terrorism, and then I ask myself, is there any hope? Is there any hope for our world? From out of the ashes of overwhelming adversity and grief, there is hope. From a season of deep pain and sorrow, there is healing. From our heritage to our present history, faith remains. Thank you for joining me here at the beautiful Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, California. I'm Clifton Davis. Over the past 200 or more years, our country has suffered many setbacks and adversities. Natural disasters, disease, war, acts of war. Our nation still mourns the events of September 11, and we remember and honor those lost and those left bereaved. Yet as Americans, we always overcome to emerge stronger and wiser. Our program today will not revisit footage of 9-11, but instead will positively reflect, embrace, and celebrate the hymns of America, hymns which have sustained us through times of thanksgiving, prosperity, and times of incredible hardship. I invite you to join me now as we follow the stories and lives of the writers of these great songs of faith, men and women who've overcome adversity and tragedies in their lives to experience the comforting hand of God. Our journey begins with a hymn that resoundingly reminds us of God's faithfulness and unconditional acceptance that sustains us. Because on that first day, you'll understand uh, no sweet sounds were heard anywhere around this place. Weeping, great tears and gnashing of teeth, all those kinds of things you read about in the Bible, they were here on that particular day. And a construction man, crude and, and probably a little overweight, digging through dirt, all of a sudden finds this little tunnel, manages to poke his head into it and sees what we believe was a divine answer to prayers that we had been making throughout the time that we were at Ground Zero. Oh God, show us your place. Show us you're here. Show us how you're going to redeem this pit. And all of a sudden, he comes out of this little tunnel, screaming, wait till you see what I found. And he pulls in ministers and uh, officials, and there, this cross is fully extended, melted together with the intense heat. The two beams were never initially part of the same structure. Heat literally melted them together. And the piece of metal that's draped over was molten metal that had literally fallen over one of the arms. And when everybody saw this, the first thing we did was cry. <laughs> and the second thing, we, we went into worship. A marvelous moment of worship. Everything stops. Construction vehicles stopped. All of the digging out of dirt, we all stopped. We looked at the cross. We fell to our knees. And we thanked God. Because at that moment, it seemed as though 
God was just placing his arms around us and saying, this pit is mine. I will redeem this pit, and I will redeem the lives of the people who are in this pit. And the message that I received at that particular day was no matter how large the pit is, how deep or how wide or how long, whatever pit it is or wherever we live, God is there to redeem it. If he did it here at Ground Zero with the World Trade Center, how much more can he do it for the world in our own pits that we carry around from day to day? Thomas Obadiah Chisholm was born in a log cabin in Franklin, Kentucky in 1866. In spite of poor health and lack of a real education, he had the intelligence and the drive to start a career as a school teacher at the young age of 16. He later became an ordained Methodist minister, but resigned his pastorate because of his poor health. After 1909, he became a life insurance agent. He retired in 1953 and spent the rest of his days in a Methodist home for the aged until his death in 1960. It may appear like an uneventful life, but Thomas Chisholm saw it very differently. My income has never been large at any time due to impaired health in the earlier years, which has followed me on until now. But I must not fail to record here the unfailing faithfulness of a covenant-keeping God and that he has given me many wonderful displays of his providing care which have filled me with astonishing gratefulness. It was this faith and reliance on God that drove Chisholm to write over 1,200 poems and hymns. Thomas Chisholm drew his inspiration for this hymn from a verse in the Book of Lamentations. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. He also turned to the Epistle of James. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. I think some of the great old hymns just keep coming to mind when you're faced with situations and you don't know what to do about them. I've just been in southern Africa and watching people dying in the famine that's raging there. Great is thy faithfulness. God will hang on to you. When Chisholm wrote it, he wrote it knowing sickness, knowing lack of money, knowing that he never had enough. Being raised in a Jewish home in the United States and then encountering Christianity, when I heard Great is Thy Faithfulness, it really touched a chord in terms of my Jewish identity and, um, and my Christian identity. I mean, I, I think Great is Thy Faithfulness might be predicated on the, um, what is it, Lamentations, you know, uh, 323 from Jeremiah. And it meant so much to me that here is a song that is, it talks about the grace of God and his mercies from an Old Testament point of view. Probably my favorite might be Great is Thy Faithfulness. O oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. O oh God, my Father, great is thy faithfulness. Think of it. As a little boy, I started to learn these words. They're still a part of my memory. They've lived in my memory system now for 75 years. I remember as a young child growing up uh, in our city, spending numerous days in the deep south um, where there was just a great deal of hardship. And I would walk with my grandmother and she would take me on these, these personal pilgrimage and to different locations where extended family members of mine were lynched during a very oppressive period of time within this country. And she would always remind me that no matter what was going on, to remain faithful, you know, in the process as a young man, because it's gonna get rough, it's not always gonna be easy, but great is thou faithfulness in our God, 
who knows your pain, who knows your struggles, and knows your dreams, but to hold on to that faith at all costs. And it's because of that faith that God will see you and pour you through. There's a reason why these great hymns have been around for so long. They may have been written some 100 years ago, some 50 years ago, but the message remains timeless. That is of God's faithfulness. One of my favorites is, Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. That is just a wonderful lyric. Um, and I'm sure written out of a passion of someone's heart because they knew that experience with God. And it's the same experience that so many of us have. I, I remember one particular um, event in my life where I really blew it. I mean, I disqualified myself from being called a believer in what I had done. And I woke up in the morning feeling totally disqualified as a minister, as a believer. The devil was having a field day with me. I mean, he was just accusing me and everything else like that. And then I heard this hymn, and I realized just as that sun popped up, it was a new day, a new opportunity. And, and God's grace was like that sun. It was there again, and it was there to say, son, it's okay. We can start over every morning, every minute. God's grace is willing to take us back if we'd only turn, confess, and embrace. That's really why the, the, the song has such passion and meaning to me. Thy faithfulness, O oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not Thy compassions, they fail. Born in 1870, the Reverend William Runyon was a musician with connections to the Moody Bible Institute. He was also an editor with the Hope Publishing Company until his death in 1957. His response to the hymn was one of awe and humility. He prayed that God would give him the right melody and music to do justice to the inspirational words he was reading. His prayer was answered, and this great hymn became one of the favorites around America. In 1954, George Beverly Shea introduced this hymn into the United Kingdom during the Billy Graham Crusades. Dr. Billy Graham and George Beverly Shea have been a remarkable team, working together now for more than 50 years. Synonymous with these two wonderful men is the majestic hymn, How Great Thou Art. Let's unfold the history behind the hymn and the impact it has had. I've had the privilege over the years to work with two incredible men of God, Billy Graham and George Beverly Shea. And to hear the two of them talk about their relationship, not just with the Lord, but with each other over the years. When they started Crusades, many years ago for 40, 50 All people. Right, um, he would sing right before Mr. Graham came to speak, and that is something they've always done. And I got to hear him sing that at one of the crusades one time, and he makes those words live in himself first. And when he sings, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. You really believe it. I'd kind of like to mention when I received the song, saw it for the first time, it was on Oxford Street in London in March of 54. We were there in the Herring A mission. And uh, one of the salesmen from a publishing company handed it to me, and he said, I was going to give it to you this evening, but here you are. And I read it over the English and the Russian hieroglyphics, and I saw the tune was very simple and beautiful. But it really got going well in, um, in New York in 57. And when I first rehearsed it in Toronto with the group, I was singing along, Oh Lord my God, 
when I in awesome wonder consider all the works, I said, worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the mighty rolling thunder, see? And uh, we had to get in touch with the translator, Mr. S.K. Hein, and a little reluctant to make those changes, but he was very gracious. And uh, as also was the publisher, they were very gracious about it. And uh, the change was made in time to uh, get into the new hymn books were coming out, and that was kind of nice. It was turbulent skies like these back in 1885, which inspired the Swedish poet and preacher Carl Boberg to write a poem entitled, O Stor Gud, O Great God. Several years later, Boberg was to hear his poem sung to an old Swedish folk tune and published both the poem and the music in a periodical he edited. After being included in a hymn book published by the Swedish Missionary Alliance in 1894, O Great God faded into obscurity and did not appear again until 1927, when it was translated from the German by the great Russian hymn translator Prokhonov. It was this Russian version which inspired Stuart Hine, who first heard it being sung in the late 1920s in the western Ukraine, where he was working as a missionary, to write the English translation that we now all know as How Great Thou Art. And he wrote the first three verses when he was doing evangelistic work in the Carpathian Mountains between Romania and Russia. And I think this is what gave him the inspiration for that marvelous opening line, when I look down from lofty mountains grandeur. This, of course, is very much a hymn about finding God's glory in creation and the way God reveals himself to us, not just in the book of his words, the Bible, but in the book of his works, the marvelous works of nature, which we see so well displayed somewhere like this, St. Andrew's Bay here in Scotland. When war broke out in Europe in 1939, Stuart Hine and his family had to return to England where they continued their gospel campaigns. In 1948, Stuart and Mercy ministered to some of the 100,000 refugees who poured into the United Kingdom from Eastern Europe and Russia. The grief and sorrow those refugees expressed at being separated from their loved ones inspired Stuart to write the fourth verse of this hymn the verse which conveys the hope of reunion in the afterlife. The song was published by Mana Music in America. Little did they know what was about to unfold when they later presented the song to George Beverly Shea in London. During Billy Graham's 1957 Crusades in New York, this hymn was so popular it had to be sung every night. It was sung 99 times throughout the duration of the campaign. During the many weeks of this memorable crusade, there is one hymn above all others that's blessed our hearts. And you've written from the far corners of our land telling of its blessing to you too. For the last time in the garden, Mr. Smith, Mr. Mickelson, Cliff Barrows and his wonderful choir join me in singing, How Great Thou Art. set of words for a, a sudden expression of praise to God, so, so natural, so wonderful, almost like scripture, isn't it? Beautiful. And, uh, you just can't tire of it, you know. And, uh, we did it uh, many, many times in the New York Crusade, but just people seem to want to hear it, you know, every night, you know. There's been a marvelous two-way traffic of hymns and hymn writers across the Atlantic. In the 18th century, it was mostly in the direction from Britain to America, led, of course, by John and Charles Wesley. And in the 19th century, it was predominantly the other way, with Dwight Moody and Ira Sankey bringing the gospel songs of Fanny Crosby here to Britain. And this mutually beneficial interchange of hymns has continued right up to our own day. 
most spectacularly, I suppose, with the Billy Graham Crusades in the 1950s and 1960s, which brought hymns like Blessed Assurance and Great is Thy Faithfulness and How Great Thou Art here to Britain. Billy Graham used How Great Thou Art as often as possible. It became the theme of his weekly television program. Well, I first heard Billy Graham when he came to Haringey, and that was a memorable experience with that enormous choir, and as you say, hymns that uh, perhaps we'd known in this country, but that had rather fallen out of use, like Blessed Assurance. I met him when I was an assistant missioner at his mission to the University of Cambridge, or in the mid-50s, I suppose, and then again when he came for Mission England and toured the country, and I was by then in East Anglia. And uh, the music with uh, Cliff Barrows leading the singing has always been one of the features that I've so admired, and a great fan of George Beverly Shea. Bev Shea has been associated with me since 1944 in the work of evangelism. You know, when Bev sings, he actually sings a sermon. When he finishes singing, I never feel like applauding. I feel like bowing my head in prayer. And if you notice, he always sings just before I preach. It would be very difficult, I think, for me to preach an evangelistic sermon without Bev singing first, because his song prepares the hearts of the people for the message as much as any single thing that happens in our crusades. When you ask me the question about the song, about the hymn, How Great Thou Art, I'm mindful of George Beverly Shea, who in fact stood on, on this very spot just uh, a little less than two months ago. And uh, he was also very touched by what he saw here that day. Fine black bishop he was, he took us there. We appreciated it so much. And uh, we had prayer, of course, and we saw some of the firemen and policemen standing around. And we were there where that, uh, they found that cross, you know, that cross that, the steel cross that uh, hadn't come down. And, uh, very moving, very moving, you know. That hymn, How Great Thou Art, just gives me a, a sense of assurance and a sense of peace that God is in control and he's allowing this particular incident here in New York to allow the Christian community to share Christ with others in a, in a needy world. Then sings my soul. This hymn became so popular, it was recorded by many artists and won two Grammy Awards. Elvis Presley recorded it in 1966 on his album entitled, How Great Thou Art, and introduced it to an even wider audience. Stuart Hine died in 1989 at the age of 89. His hymn uplifted many hearts and souls during his life and continues to do so today. In a poll in 1974, How Great Thou Art was voted the number one hymn in the USA, and on the eve of the third millennium, it was voted the nation's favorite hymn by viewers of the BBC's Songs of Praise in the UK. George Beverly Shea was instrumental in making How Great Thou Art popular in the US. Bev Shea recalls singing this hymn to American troops in Vietnam. Two days before Christmas, a colonel took me out in his jeep to a compound. Cliff was taken in one to another, and Billy and another. As we approached this compound, I saw a Christmas tree with a lot of presents in the bottom of it and guy ropes holding it up. And under a tree was a whole line of, of our men, just come off the line. They were receiving haircuts. And somebody hollered from a distance. I was standing by the tree. Hey, Shay, sing How Great Thou Art. I was moved by that, you know. I went, oh, Lord, my God, and I put my hands up to so. But that, that was meaningful uh, <laughs> to me, I tell you. An awesome display of nature. 
a Swedish pastor's poetic response, an old Swedish melody. Subsequent translations include German and English and Russian, a faithful English missionary couple ministering in Russia, the heartwarming singing of a American gospel singer, George Beverly Shea, and another great immortal hymn was born that was destined to inspire future generations with the unsearchable greatness of their almighty God. A hymn that teaches three very important truths. The greatness of God's creation. Without him, nothing was made that was made. The greatness of Christ's redemption, reconciling us to God and the greatness of his eternal promise, I will come again, receive it to myself, that where I am, you may be also. How great thou art. When September 11th happened and the tragedy there, my heart immediately went out to my own nation in a way that it never has before. And I instantly felt a, a desire, a strong desire to be in New York, partly because I wanted to be able to understand the immensity of what was happening in my own nation. And because also I wanted to do something. I didn't really know what I could do. I felt really small and insignificant. I was only 19 at the time. Nothing, nothing, nothing could have prepared me for what it was like to actually be there. I'd seen the images on TV. I'd, I'd been glued to the television set like most other Americans at the time. Um, but nothing could have prepared me for what it was actually like to stand on the ground, to watch the people, um, to see the destruction, and, and to feel the hopelessness, and to feel um, the sorrow. It was so overwhelming that the, even the thought of actually being able to talk to someone else and try to minister to them was nearly impossible for me in my own heart. Um, I felt completely just helpless. And, and I saw a few times firemen and rescue workers and sanitation workers coming in and out of, of the actual site. And seeing them took my breath away. Um, these men and, and women that were suddenly heroes in my nation. Um, but the sorrow and the pain that was on their faces was just um, more than I could bear. There was a small stone chapel sitting at the base of Ground Zero called St. Paul's Chapel. It was built in the 1700s and a beautiful little church. And almost immediately after um, the buildings collapsed, St. Paul's became a sort of of refuge to the men and women that were working and the people that were hurt. And we went to the chapel that night and um, spent t the 12 hours of 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. Um, just serving coffee, serving food, lighting candles, rearranging flowers. When I first walked into the chapel, my breath was taken away by what I saw from floor to ceiling, wall to wall, covering every pew, everywhere you looked was cards and notes and letters from children all around the world um, to the men and women that were working at Ground Zero. And you could literally not be anywhere in the chapel without seeing one of these cards or letters, even in the bathrooms. Um, the lights were all off and, and it was just softly lit by candles, just hundreds of candles all over the chapel and fresh flowers everywhere. And there was the feeling of, um, of just a solemnness and very quietness and um, peace, amazingly peace. I think it was in all of our hearts to be able to talk to the men and, and in some way comfort them. But the truth is, is there was just no words that could have expressed what was in our hearts. Um, for the first few hours, I walked around sort of aimlessly around the chapel trying to find things to do. And I ended up at the front um, near the altar on the floor and I had a huge pile of, of roses next to me and I was rearranging the vases and um, rearranging the flowers. And I began to hear um, a piano playing really softly. And I, I looked over and I saw one of the girls on my team had been brave enough to open the, the piano up and begin to play. and. Um, 
And I looked on the other side of the room and a fireman was just walking slowly towards her. And he sat down next to her on the bench and um, he asked her to play a song. And she began to play and they began to sing. And, um, and at that moment, things became very, very real to me. And the power of the words of the song, and despite all of, of the sorrow and pain and um, lack of understanding and confusion and hopelessness, um, that there was still such a steady stream of peace there that was just unexplainable. But through these words, there was a bridge. And ever since that night, the words to the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, were burned in my heart. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is. If ever there was a hymn that represents the triumph of faith and hope over personal tragedy and despair, it is well with my soul would have to be it. I think it was able to give me some perspective, just understanding and listening to the words of the song um, and how great, you know, God is and giving us peace that surpasses all understanding. We had peace, and we had grief. And the grief didn't overwhelm the peace. I think that was the thing that was so awesome, and, and that's really the message to me, and, and it is well with my soul, in that you can have incredible travail and your whole world being turned upside down. And yet the peace that surpasses all understanding, that your soul can be at peace, that your spirit can be at peace in the midst of chaos, that's exactly what took place. The Great Chicago Fire of 1871 was perhaps one of the most catastrophic peacetime disasters to impact our nation prior to 9-11. It killed many people while destroying the lives of thousands of Chicago residents, its infrastructure, and businesses. Among those affected was Horatio G. Spafford and his family, a wealthy lawyer and real estate developer, and a godly man. Although his wealth was wiped out by the fire, Horatio was grateful that he still had his family, his wife Anna, and their four beautiful daughters. Their daughters were Anna, age nine, Margaret Lee, seven, Elizabeth, five, Tanita, 18 months. They brought Horatio and Anna enormous joy. After rebuilding their lives, and helping so many others who suffered in the aftermath of the Great Fire, the Spaffords decided to take a needed break and go on a European vacation while also supporting the evangelistic work of Dwight L. Moody and Ira Sankey in England. 
The family was booked to leave in November 1873 on the luxury steamship Ville du Havre. However, some last minute business matters kept Horatio in America, so he farewelled his wife, daughters, and friends, expecting to join them later in France. In the mid Atlantic, the Ville du Havre was struck by an English iron sailing vessel, the Lockhearn, and sank within 12 minutes. Anna and her children were sucked into the ocean as the ship sank, and the little, her youngest daughter, Tanetta, was dragged from her arms and she became unconscious. When she awoke, she was at the bottom of a boat being rescued, and she thought she heard a voice at that point saying to her, Anna, you have been saved for a reason. As hard as she tried, Anna could not rescue her children. All four daughters drowned. Officially, 226 passengers had drowned that day. Anna was one of only 47 survivors. Anna was saved, and as the ship arrived in England, she was able to send a telegram to Horatio saying, saved alone. The grieving father and husband rushed to be with his wife on the next ship to England. A few days into the journey, the captain asked Horatio to his cabin and told him that by his reckoning, they were at that moment over the site of the wreck where his children had drowned. Spafford's heart and soul were comforted by the words from the book of Isaiah, chapter 66, verse 12. And this is what the Lord says, I will extend peace to her like a river. So right there in his cabin, as he reflected on the place where his children had died, Horatio was inspired to write the opening stanza of his now famous and enduring hymn. Finally, reunited with Anna in Cardiff, her words to him were, we have not lost our children, we are only separated for a little while. On return to Chicago, Horatio completed the text of the hymn. The other reason I like it as well with my soul is when my brother Craig had a very serious car accident and he was in a coma for about two months. Every day, my mom and myself and my dad we would go into him not knowing whether he could hear us or not, and we would sing It Is Well With My Soul every day to him. A year or so later, we were in church, and he had come out of his coma, and we were singing that song. And he turned to me and he said, I don't know why, but this song is so special to me. And we were able to tell him at that time, every day, Craig, for two and a half months, we would go in to your room in critical care, and we would sing that song to you. And it was a very sweet and tender moment. It is a declaration, a bold declaration of faith to say in the midst of tragedy, it is well with my soul. Especially in the midst of an absence of closure. Closure is something that everybody has to have at some point if they're gonna get on with their lives. And when your loved one has just disappeared, it's very hard to have closure. I, Horatio was not there when his children were drowned. He was uh, able to pass over the spot. And that's, I think, when the Lord spoke to him and he wrote the hymn, and it was a start of closure. Being able to return to a place like uh, the Pentagon or like one of the uh, buildings that was blown up, uh, is a way for people to then feel like they have some kind of closure. If people could only grasp the message of that song, that no matter what, in God, 
it is well with my soul. Because there's closure in Christ and in his grace. He'll bring the closure to your heart and the peace that this world so much lacks. And so the word, the message of that song is powerful, especially when it came from the situation of circumstance that was that it was birthed from. There's nothing that can describe how a man's feelings of such great loss and yet God with what he imparts in place of the loss is marvelous. When I finally got the courage to talk, I only told my daughter. And when I finally shared with her that um, Auntie Janice was not um, yet found, but that we were believing God for whatever his will was, I really depended upon our faith to teach our children that whatever the will of God is in this, we have to, to say, it's well. Even as the ash was falling in the stairwell, they're singing, it is well with my soul. Uh, they're singing redeemed, step by step, inch by inch, as they creep down this quickening, darkening stairwell to try and find out if they were even gonna get out. They sang back and forth, and they didn't know how to pray. The people around them said, we don't know. So they sang the All Father together. And that brought them down uh, to waiting arms of emergency relief workers. And I remember very clearly on the second day, I was just at the very edge of the pit and all the workers were pushing their hands this way and yelling, run, run. And I didn't look back. In fact, I didn't know I could run so fast, but I remember clasping my ID in my hands because it was laminated, thinking that if I were to die, maybe they could identify my body through my ID that I held in my hands. And as I ran, I had such an incredible peace come over me. And I remember looking heavenward and thinking, okay, God, if this is it, if this is my time, then everything is well with my soul and I'm ready to go. Way back in the Old Testament, you recall Job, but out of all his troubles, he said, Though he slay me, yet will I praise him, trust him. Horatio Spafford said much the same thing. In the midst of all of his troubles, I have learned that it, whatever comes into my life, it is well. It is well with my soul. We're sitting here in Chicago this morning, and I can't help but think about Horatio Spafford's marvelous words and the example that he has given us and I'm sure that if Horatio could stand here this morning and speak to all of us, he would say, what God did for me back there in 1873, God can do for you. By December 1876, the Spaffords were back in Chicago and little Horatio Jr. was born. A daughter, Bertha, was born too in 1878 and their lives seemed to have regained a sense of normality again. But in February 1880, while Horatio was away on business, their young son contracted scarlet fever and died. In 1881, they had their last child, a wonderful daughter they named Grace. In the same year, they packed up and moved to Jerusalem for a sabbatical. It was not intended to be a permanent move, just a sojourn of healing and reflection to the Holy Land with some other like-minded friends. In that day and age, so many people in the church felt that if you had sorrow in your life and things were not going well, that you were being punished for being a sinner. And Horatio didn't believe that but he finally decided that he wanted to go to Jerusalem 
where his Lord had lived and suffered and conquered. And he said, I want to go to learn to live, to learn to suffer, and mostly to learn to conquer. So they packed up one trunk. They gave away to the poor their home, their jewels, their paintings, everything, and left. And were eventually joined by others there. But they, once they got there, they found there was so much need, so much suffering, poverty, that they never came back. Soon these sojourners set up a community of faith with other American families called the American Colony. Their mission became to answer God's call by working with the poor and needy locals they encountered in the Holy Land. Horatio and Anna Spafford went to Jerusalem in 1881. They went for their personal renewal after the tragedy of losing their children and then of losing little Horatio. And they started work because they saw a tremendous need in Jerusalem. There was so much poverty. Anna says there was filth in the streets everywhere. And their experience in Chicago with the, the reconstruction helped them to establish a plan and a program to help people. And this was something that they wanted to do and I think really needed to do because they needed to give of themselves to restore themselves. Horatio Spafford died in Jerusalem in 1888, but his wife Anna continued the work they started together. Their daughter Bertha, Peter Lynn's grandmother, dedicated her whole life to the work of the colony, which continues today in Jerusalem. It is now called the Spafford Children's Center and provides health, educational, and counseling services to the poor and needy, a legacy of Horatio and Anna's great faith. It survives today just by people who have visited Jerusalem or who have read the story of the hymn or who have encountered or experienced a member of the family in some way. It's sometimes difficult. It depends on the times. These are not the best times, but then again, we've had an amazing response to the needs of the children. And I, I just hope and pray that those responses continue because that's the only way we can keep the center open. I'm so committed to the children and the children, the special cases that haven't been able to walk and I go to the center and they walk across the waiting room to me. It is the most incredible sensation. I can't tell you what it means to know that you've been able to help a child to have a decent future. Blessed Assurance has impacted my life in a significant and profound way. The story of Fanny Crosby, well, inspires and amazes me as I reflect upon this outstanding woman and her great faith through adversity. I invite you to allow the life of this remarkable woman to inspire you as it has me. The small town of Southeast in Putnam County, New York State, was the most unlikely starting place for one of the greatest figures in hymn writing both in America and the world. The name Fanny Crosby may not ring many bells today, but in an extraordinary life of 95 years, this diminutive woman wrote well over 8,000 hymns under some 250 pen names,
She also wrote and published poetry and patriotic songs. No mean feat, we might say, but this remarkable lady still managed to find time to teach the blind, go on evangelistic missions, and befriend 22 U.S. presidents from John Quincy Adams to Woodrow Wilson. She was the first woman in American history to address both houses of Congress where she lobbied for more schools to teach America's blind and still found the time, energy, and compassion to work with the homeless and down and outs of New York. She was so popular and loved by all that she came to be known simply as Aunt Fanny. Not bad for a little girl who became permanently blind at the age of six weeks. Fanny was an amazing example of faith and courage. Later in her life, when asked about her blindness, she responded, if I could ever meet the doctor who spoiled my eyes, I would tell him that he unwittingly did me the greatest favor in the world. Fanny was born into a Puritan family in this humble home in 1820. At the age of six weeks, the wrong remedy prescribed by an apprentice physician blinded her for life. By the age of 10 months, her father died. This left her widowed mother, Mercy, and her grandmother, Eunice, to bring her up and instill in her a love of God and the courage to overcome the limitations of her disability. I suppose the most striking quality about Fanny Crosby is her utter stalwart faith. Despite her blindness and the loneliness that it must have caused, she's still able to say, I, in my savior, am happy and blessed. She wrote thousands of hymns, uh, over 8,000 altogether. She was under contract from several publishers to produce five or six a week. And if they do sometimes seem a bit as though they've come off a production line, what they lack in imagination and subtlety, they more than make up for in that simple, straightforward, personal faith. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Fanny tried to attend school, but the teachers did not know how to teach a blind student. She daily prayed for the education she sought. Fanny once said, so night and night again I had gone to bed drearily weeping because I could not drink of the waters of knowledge that I knew were surging all around me. Dear God, please give me light, was my prayer, a mental light. Sooner or later I rose from my knees feeling that my prayers would soon be answered. And those prayers were answered. On March 3rd, 1835, Fanny Crosby was accepted into the New York Institution for the Blind. Her response was, that was the happiest day of my life, for the dark intellectual maze in which I had been living seemed to yield to the hope and the promise of a light that was about to dawn. On 34th Street and 9th Avenue stood the New York Institute for the Blind. In 1835, at the age of 14, Fanny was the 31st student to attend this new school. With a sprightly spirit and a voracious appetite for knowledge, she excelled in all subjects except arithmetic, which she hated with a passion. Fanny just couldn't understand arithmetic. One of her earliest poems was, I loathe, abhor, it makes me sick to hear the word arithmetic. Fanny's real passion was poetry. She became the resident poet of the school and wrote poems for all occasions. This unassuming girl was so outstanding at poetry that her poems were soon being published. Her first book of poetry, The Blind Girl and Other Poems, was published in 1844. The fourth and final one, in 1897, at the ripe old age of 77. Her home is near an ancient wood where many an oak gigantic stood, and fragrant flowers of every hue in that sequestered valley grew. A church there reared its little spire, and in their neat and plain attire, the humble farmers would repair on Sabbath morn to worship there. Fanny spent 23 years at the school, first as a student, then as a teacher. She left the school in 1858 when she married Alexander Van Alstein, a blind colleague 11 years her junior. Their happiness, though, 
were shattered when their baby died of what we today call sudden infant death syndrome. Losing their baby was a grief that Fanny lived with her whole life and found it very difficult to talk about. However, this tragedy didn't stop her from proclaiming a message of faith and hope, both through her hymns and her mission work in New York. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Ear of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit. my story this is my song in the spring of 1848 cholera arrived in new york city in the blind school one of the youngest students was the first to become ill fanny held her on her lap and she said miss crosby i'm going home i just wanted to bid you farewell and tell you that i love you Toward evening, she died, and before sunrise, Fanny and the other teachers carried her body to Trinity Cemetery. It was here at Trinity Church, just a few blocks from Ground Zero, where Fanny attended services. Having spent most of her life in New York City, Fanny finally moved to Bridgeport, Connecticut in 1900 due to declining health. She lived there first with her sister, Carrie, then with her niece, Florence, and Florence's husband, Henry, who cared for her for the rest of her life. It is a well-known fact that every day, Fanny would sit outside to talk with visitors coming to meet her. This is the very chair in which Fanny sat till the wee hours of the morning composing the words to her hymns. But this last phase of her life wasn't spent in quiet retirement. She still traveled and spoke to many of the missions, YMCAs, and churches from Niagara Falls to Maine to Washington, D.C. The year was 1912. Fanny Crosby was 91 years old when she traveled from Bridgeport, Connecticut to New York City and addressed 5,000 people at Carnegie Hall. Her address was as follows. O oh, men of the Empire City, you are dear to my heart. This scene takes me back to my 20 25 years of mission work. When I came in and you greeted me so warmly, I wanted to weep tears of joy. I shall pray for a million souls to be saved, and I shall pray until every one of them is gathered into mercy. Fanny had a heart for people who were hurting. Her occupation was as a hymn writer, but personal ministry was to people one-on-one, -on -one. the alcoholics and the prostitutes. Fanny had a great love and burden for these people. That's why they called her Aunt Fanny. Fanny died peacefully in 1915. At her funeral, people lined up for blocks to pay their respects. When Fanny's friend P.T. Barnum died, a large monument was placed upon his grave. Fanny's niece Florence brought her to visit the grave, and as Fanny laid her hands upon the monument, she said it was lovely, but she'd have nothing like it for herself. She wanted a living monument in her memory, a place for the less fortunate. In 1920, the Fanny Crosby Memorial Home was founded to continue her ministry to the poor and the needy. This is my story. This is my song. Praising us. As for Fanny, her simple gravestone reads, Aunt Fanny, she hath done what she could. The composer of this great Aunt Fanny hymn was her friend Phoebe Palmer Knapp, born in 1839 in New York and died in 1908 in Poland Springs, Maine. 
Her father was the doctor and Methodist evangelist Walter C. Palmer. Phoebe married Joseph Fairfield Knapp, one of the founders of the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. Although wealthy, Phoebe had a great heart for the poor too and involved herself in charitable work. From 1868, she had a deep friendship with Fanny. She gave Fanny financial support and composed the music for many of her most loved hymns. Apart from being one of the most popular hymns of the 19th and 20th centuries, this hymn could be seen to reflect God's sense of humor in that the wife of a life insurance man wrote the music to Blessed Assurance. Fanny lived a simple life. Her friends would give her money and she used what she needed and gave the rest to the poor. Phoebe Knapp got around this by buying Fanny things rather than giving her money. Blessed Assurance was written in 1873. The story goes that while Phoebe was visiting Fanny, she played her the melody on the piano, then asked what Fanny thought it said. Fanny answered, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine, and instantly completed the hymn we know today. Our final hymn, Amazing Grace, has been sung extensively throughout our nation since September 11th. In recent days, it has become an anthem of comfort and hope to all of us. There was a, uh, a, a clinical psychologist who worked with us for two weeks. Dr. Nina was her name. And uh, she pulled me to this very cross one day and said, you know, Major, God's going to redeem this. She says she looks at the men who are working in the bottom of this pit. She says she sees Shekinah glory, glory of God. And she said at that moment, something I'll never forget. She said, you don't hear a lot of sweet sounds, but amazing grace. How sweet the sound. All of a sudden, I'm realizing that God's amazing grace is really the ministry of His Holy Spirit that's not only working on my life, but the lives of hundreds, thousands of volunteers, uniformed heroes from fire department, Port Authority Police, the New York Police Department, EMTs, a slew of individuals who have had their hands in this event and this dirt, and these human remains and ashes. And it's God's grace. What a sweet sound. Amazing grace is that hymn. Over 200 years ago, a 47-year-old local parish minister leaves his vicarage for a short walk across the village green to his church. It's January 1, 1773, a Friday morning in this picturesque market town of Olney in the heart of England. The congregation files in to hear the message that will usher in the new year. What the townsfolk came to hear was a sermon on God's redeeming grace. The wonderful grace that redeemed the deliverer of that sermon, John Newton, from his life of debauchery and slave trading. A grace that prepared him to lead a life of service to the church and to become a powerful voice in the anti-slavery movement. These original handwritten sermon notes show us that his thoughts that morning revolved around how we should respond to God's bountiful goodness and mercy. To complement his message of grace, redemption, and hope, John Newton introduced that morning his new hymn,
Amazing Grace has always been much loved here in Scotland. And indeed, not so long ago, it got into the hit parade when it was recorded by the pipes and drums of one of our Scottish regiments. But it's perhaps most effective when it's just played by a lone piper. Amazing Grace was one of literally thousands of hymns that was written in the 18th century in what is called common metre. That's with a basic rhyming scheme of 8686. And as such, it could be sung to countless different tunes. For example, it may well have been sung to this tune. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. I once was lost but now am found, was blind, but now I see. The tune that we almost universally use now is actually an American folk tune called Virginia Harmony, which probably started off life here in Scotland and was brought across the Atlantic by Scottish emigrants in the 18th century. In those days, there was no dedicated tune for a particular hymn. Indeed, there was nothing like the modern hymn book that we have now with a particular tune paired to a particular set of words. There were simply books of words and books of tunes. And if you wanted to sing a hymn, you, you picked any tune you liked from the tune book that happened to have the right meter. John Newton was born in 1725 in Wapping near the Tower of London. His father was a merchant ship captain who was away at sea most of the time. His mother was a loving and godly woman who prayed fervently for her son's soul. She died when young John was only six. He only spent two years at school. His first sea voyage at the age of 11 with his father set him on his future career path. He was articled to serve with a merchant in Spain at the age of 15 and continued his seafaring life for 15 more years, almost half of them as a slave trader. He traveled throughout the Mediterranean, West Africa, and the Caribbean and wholeheartedly embraced the life of depravity, often associated with sailors of the time. He is quoted as saying that those years drove all of his mother's godly teachings out of him. He also suffered his share of hardship. In 1744, he was press-ganged into the British Navy against his will. He was rebellious and impetuous, and was on one occasion stripped, whipped, and chained to the deck as punishment for desertion. When he was finally put on a merchant ship, he went to Sierra Leone to work for a slave trader, Amos Clough. Newton probably thought his fortunes had changed, but he contracted a fever here and was so sick that he was left behind among the slaves in the camp. After the near fatal fever passed, he was so neglected that he nearly starved to death and was treated as a slave. It was only the slaves feeding him food scraps that kept him alive. In spite of this harrowing experience and the kindness of the African slaves toward him, Newton continued in the slave trade even after he was rescued from this situation. It was during the voyage back from Africa in 1748 on the ship the Greyhound that he felt the first stirrings of God. He was passing the time at sea reading Thomas a. Kempis's book, The Imitation of Christ. A storm hit. The situation was so dire that he found himself instinctively praying. There was loss of life, with the ship barely managing to limp to safety. In February 1750, he married his childhood sweetheart, Mary Catlett, but by May, he was off again, this time as the captain of a slave ship. His newfound faith had not yet changed his view of the slave trade. I, for a long time had a, a love of the old sailing ships. And uh, five or six years ago, I got a chance to visit the African American Museum in Detroit. And there's a, uh, an exhibit in that museum that shows uh, various timbers 
uh, bearing the names of the various ships that carried my ancestors from their home to this place. It made it impossible to look at those ships the same ever again. And to think that John Newton was part of that industry, but was changed by the same God and the same grace that got hold of my life. As African American, um, it means a whole lot, again, because of where we come from. God has been a God in every situation, and it's because of his grace that we're still here and that we're here in strong numbers. And, and that's why I think this hymn is so important to our African American church. We sing it, and you probably hear it every week somewhere in our churches because it has been a strong foundation of our churches. The slave trade sea life was all he knew, but Newton started to treat the slaves with some new dignity. By 1755, he was tired of being away from Mary, the love of his life. His health quite suddenly deteriorated and made him unfit for the sea. So he finally settled in Liverpool with Mary and took a job as a tide surveyor until 1764. It was during this time that his faith grew. He soon felt a strong calling to enter full-time ministry in the Church of England. But he faced an obstacle. No one in the Church of England would ordain him, not because of his dubious past or his lack of talent, but because he did not have a university degree. However, the Earl of Dartmouth so admired Newton's work and heart that he offered him the position of curate at the church in Olney. The Earl used his influence to finally have Newton ordained. John Newton's appointment at Olney was a classic example of aristocratic patronage, the kind of thing we usually associate with the worldliness and corruption of the 18th century church. But in this particular case, of course, if it hadn't been for the Earl of Dartmouth's intervention, the church would have lost one of its great spiritual giants and one of its greatest ever hymn writers. Newton spent the next 16 years here in this small country parish. He enlisted his close literary friend, William Cooper, who lived just behind the vicarage, to assist him in writing new hymns for his Sunday and midweek services. They inspired each other to write powerful hymns to express the personal experience of faith. John Newton became not just William Cooper's spiritual director, but also his great companion. The two men regularly spent up to eight hours a day together. They visited the sick together, they went out riding, and they also often went out walking down by the river near Olney. And it was actually Newton who suggested to Cooper that they collaborate on a hymn book in an attempt to stave off his friend's persistent melancholy. And so the two men set to work together in a spirit of friendly rivalry to see who could write the most hymns. These hymns were published in 1779 as the only hymns and became widely accepted. Newton held the view that it was important to sing songs that expressed faith in a heartfelt and contemporary language. Amazing Grace was one of those bridge songs because it had been part of the, the folk scene of uh, American, you know, American folk music. Uh, it was a hymn, but it was more than a hymn. It was, it was something that was part of our, you know, music history, so to speak. And, and so and then when I got saved, when I came to know what Amazing Grace really was, all of a sudden it, it had new meaning. It was like, yeah, there's something real here, you know, and, and it really has the power to transform lives. I'd heard that there was a story of a man who had come down the first tower to be hit, and his name is Brian Webb. He was coming down the tower, 
and he said his mind went totally blank, that all he could think was, help God, help us. And he went into the, ta into the stairwell that was closest to him and with many others, and as everyone did, they just filed in. And he started just to bring some life back because you're deadened with the shock. Uh, not knowing, they didn't know what happened. And as they're starting to walk down, he started to quietly sing to himself songs that were close to him. And he just started humming these songs. And people down below started calling back up the stairwell to him. Sing it louder, sing it louder. And so he felt strengthened in himself and he began to sing it louder. And a man with him, when he would take a breath or need a, to stop just for a second, would sing a song. He, he started with Amazing Grace, and he sang, they said they sang that over and over, coming down the stairwell. And I, I, you know, you can just imagine, step by step, coming down the stairwell, singing Amazing Grace, stanza after stanza, and it going, echoing up and down. But there's a, the verse in the song that says, through many dangers, toils and snares, I've already come. It was grace that brought me safe this far. And I think that those words to families that are hurting, that are dealing with loss, they can say, you know, through many dangers, even when God has brought us through this, knowing that we don't see why, and we want the answers to why, but it's been grace that brought us safe thus far. And we depend upon our faith to know that grace will lead us. I have seen Amazing Grace used in America in a way to bring people who are hurting together. It's kind of like an anthem. Amazing Grace means everything to me. It is because of God's grace that I'm here today. It's because of God's grace that I know Him, that I love Him, and that I live a life of hope and happiness. Newton also held the view that Christianity was not limited to worship and church duties, but extended into our daily lives as we went about our normal business. When he moved to London, he counseled William Wilberforce, a young and dashing member of Parliament, to remain in politics where God had placed him and use his position to change society at this high level. Inspired by Newton's radical advice, Wilberforce devoted his political life to social reform. The abolition of slavery became one of his principal causes, with strong backing by Newton, who had by then come to see slavery and everything associated with it as immoral and indeed evil. In 1780, Newton took up the reins at St. Mary's Woolnoth, London a position that put him in close contact with the movers and shakers of the day. But instead of pandering to their social sensibilities, Newton continued to preach a strong and challenging message of social reform to London's high society. During his time at St. Mary Woolnoth, John Newton took up not just the anti-slavery cause, but all sorts of other campaigns and crusades he was appalled to discover, for example, that more than 200 offences still carried the death penalty in early 18th century England, including such an apparently trivial crime as stealing five shillings. And he campaigned vigorously to get these and other laws liberalised and reformed. Several historians have in fact argued that it was these social reform campaigns led by evangelicals like Newton that prevented England having the kind of bloody revolution that took place across the Channel in France at the end of the 18th century. Newton became one of the prime movers in the British abolitionist movement. He was so disgusted by the slave trade and his past involvement in it that he took every opportunity to speak out against it and to describe from his own experience the horrors the unfortunate slaves had to suffer. In 1788, the British Parliament finally formed a parliamentary committee to investigate the slave trade thoroughly. Newton was called in 1790 to give evidence. Well into his 60s and ailing, Newton finally had the opportunity to right some of the wrongs he had perpetrated. His words on that day were, O Lord, it is all thy doings. To thee be also the praise. 
To me belongs the shame and confusion of face, for I'm a poor, vile creature to this hour. William Wilberforce continued the fight against slavery in Parliament, encouraged by Newton and others. It was a long fight with strong opposition, but in March 1807, 17 years after Newton gave his evidence to the Parliamentary Committee, the British Parliament finally abolished all British slavery. Newton was 82 years old by then. His health had deteriorated, his memory was all but gone, and he was almost completely deaf and blind. But he lived to rejoice in that victory against the great evil that he had known and perpetrated in his earlier life. Nine months later, four days before Christmas, Newton died. As I approached the end of my days, with my memory, hearing, and eyesight nearly gone, many well-intentioned friends often suggest that I retire. My response is always the same. What? Shall the old African blasphemer stop while he can still speak for God? My memory may be failing, but I will always remember two things, that I am a great sinner, and that Christ is a great savior. These were the words of John Newton shortly before his death at the age of 82. A life, an expression, a ministry that made such an impact upon the Christian world, really on both sides of the ocean in England, well around the world. Thank God for the transformed life of John Newton. Amazing Grace has become, I believe, the Christian national anthem. I sing for the New York City Police Department the American national anthem all over the city. And yet, Amazing Grace has become an anthem for the cause of Christ. It's been God's love song to his creation for generations now. And uh, to pick up on God's amazing grace and for the people to hold that dear to their heart is something to be grasped. I have a coworker who is a great gospel singer. I personally think that no one sings Amazing Grace better than him, but I'm partial to him. His name is Tim Moorer. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I've been to only England at the site of where uh, John Newton had a church, you know, the community church, the Episcopal Church of Church of England, and he's buried there in the corner of the churchyard. So way over in the corner, at a, at a stone uh, fence that looked to have been there a thousand years, about well, that far away, to the back of the stone, we squatted down and we saw something that's written in the back, and it said, John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was uh, by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. This is the view from Newton's attic study from the vicarage in Olney. For 16 years, this was his spiritual retreat, the place where he prayed, 
meditated, and wrote his sermons and hymns. Newton installed this plaque as a constant reminder to himself that he too was once a slave, yet was redeemed by God's love. It was in this room that in the last week of 1772, Newton prepared these sermon notes and where he wrote the hymn that has become one of the best known and most loved gospel songs of all time. Grace, one of the most beautiful words in the English language. I know we use it these days to mean elegance and style, but for me, it's boundless love. It's a love that doesn't judge, it doesn't look at your past, your race, or your color. It is the love that accepts us for what we are and makes us free. It redeems us, and the Lord knows how we need redeeming. That's why I, we all love this great hymn because deep down inside, we all know that somewhere, sometime in our lives, we need that. I don't think it was an accident that God used John Newton, a reformed and redeemed slave trader, to write this hymn so many years ago. A hymn that is so loved by our nation because God helped him understand that he too was a slave to his ways and needed God's grace to be free, to be redeemed. And I say amen to that. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but found was blind but now I see the writer of this patriotic hymn was Catherine Lee Bates born in Falmouth Massachusetts in 1859 her father died when she was only one month old in spite of this early setback the bright and articulate Catherine grew up to become a respected English professor and spent most of her professional career teaching at Wellesley College. It was in 1893, when looking out from Pikes Peak, Colorado, that she was inspired to write this wonderful poem, which not only describes the beauty of our vast country, but also prays that God sheds his grace on us so that we uphold the values of brotherhood, liberty, self-control, and nobility. Unless we crown our good with brotherhood, what earthly value are our spacious skies, our majestic mountains, our fruited plains? We must learn to match our greatness with personal godly living. These were the words of Catherine Lee Bates, who wrote our wonderful patriotic hymn, America the Beautiful. America the Beautiful has many distinctions. It was one of the great hymns during World War I. Uh, did much to raise the morale and the, and the encouragement of our people during that difficult time. And then you recall that in 1960, America the Beautiful was the first him, the first song ever played in outer space. And since September the 11th, once again, America the Beautiful has been on the hearts and lips of people, millions of people in this country. And I think there was 
such hope that emerged from it as well that people didn't just give up and stay cloistered in their homes. They said, you know what, we're still going to go to church. We're still going to go to the ball games. We're still going to go out to dinner with our family. You cannot beat the American spirit. This poem became so popular when it was published that people tried to set it to at least 74 different melodies. But none were considered good enough until the tune we know today, which was written by Samuel A. Ward. It's very comforting, the song, just to listen to the words. And um, it's our song. It's our home song, America the Beautiful. To me, this hymn embodies all that is good about our country and the foundations of faith and hope it was built on. And it still speaks to us today as we discover new hope and meaning in the 21st century. And I trust that you've been enriched by this journey through these great hymns of faith. Thanks for joining me. I'm Clifton Davis. Bye now.
I was watching the news a while ago, and I just thought to myself how much suffering there is in the whole world. War, terrorism, people still filled with anxiety because of September 11th, racism and bigotry, a cause of so much suffering in the world. And then I ask myself, is there any hope? Is there any hope for our world? A top movie this year has been The Lord of the Rings. It's a fantasy, but the story illustrates that we're all in a battle. I'm in it with you. The good and the evil are battling in our hearts. I'm gonna give you a verse of scripture. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God is love. He said, I've loved you with an everlasting love. And when you come to Christ and receive his love, he can love through you to people you don't like. That's the amazing thing. You may not like people of another race, you may not like people of another culture, but you can love them. Because if you receive Christ into your heart, he will love through you. And we're never going to solve a lot of problems that you read about in your newspaper apart from the love of God. If God comes into your heart and you yield to his son Christ, Whatever problem you have can be taken to him. And you'll find a peace and a joy and a happiness that you never knew. The Bible says, for it's by grace that we are saved through faith and not, not of yourselves. I can't work my way to heaven. I can't buy my way to heaven. I can only come to the cross and beg. Oh God, receive me. And he will. He's never turned anybody away. <laughs> Accepting Christ may not change your circumstances, but Christ will change you from the inside out. You'll have a new perspective on life and a new inner strength to meet each day as it comes. I can't explain how it happens, but I believe it does. And I believe that Christ can come into your life and sweep it clean and give you an inward peace and a joy that you've never known. God is love, and he loves you tonight. Let him forgive you and give you a new life, and he'll do that.
When September 11th um, happened and the tragedy there, my heart immediately went out to my own nation in a way that it never has before. And I instantly felt a, a desire, a strong desire to be in New York, partly because I wanted to be able to understand the immensity of what was happening in my own nation. And because also I wanted to do something. I didn't really know what I could do. I felt really small and insignificant. I was only 19 at the time. Nothing, nothing, nothing could have prepared me for what it was like to actually be there. I had seen the images on TV. I'd, I'd been glued to the television set like most other Americans at the time. Um, but nothing could have prepared me for what it was actually like to stand on the ground, to watch the people, um, to see the destruction, and, and to feel the hopelessness, and to feel um, the sorrow. It was so overwhelming that the, even the thought of actually being able to talk to someone else and try to minister to them was nearly impossible for me in my own heart. Um, I felt completely just helpless, and, and I just, uh, growing feeling of of being sort of silly and, and what am I doing here, this this kid, like I'm gonna help anything. Um, we walked around and, and handed out some hot chocolate and coffee um, and and I saw a few times firemen and rescue workers and sanitation workers coming in and out of, of the actual site and seeing them took my breath away. Um, these men and, and women that were suddenly heroes in my nation. Um, but the sorrow and the pain that was on their faces was just um, more than I could bear. There was a small stone chapel sitting at the base of Ground Zero called St. Paul's Chapel. And it was built in the 1700s and a beautiful little church. And when the building was attacked and it fell, all of the surrounding buildings around it, the, the windows were smashed in um, or damaged really greatly, but for some reason this little stone chapel was unscathed, it wasn't touched, not a window was broken. And almost immediately after um, the buildings collapsed, St. Paul's became a sort of, of refuge to the men and women that were working and the people that were hurt. We went back to the church we were staying in that night, and as my team was talking and sort of debriefing, about what we had just seen the phone ring, and it was the volunteer coordinator at St. Paul's, and he explained to us that St. Paul's was being used to, to feed and, um, and to take care of the rescue workers and the people that were working around the clock every single day. And he said, we're, there's a shortage in volunteers to feed the men. Will you come for 12 hours tonight? Um, of course, my team was, was thrilled and extremely humbled and surprised at, at this opportunity. And we went to the chapel that night and um, spent the 12 hours of 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. Um, just serving coffee, serving food, lighting candles, rearranging flowers. When I first walked into the chapel, um, my breath was taken away by what I saw from floor to ceiling, wall to wall, covering every pew, everywhere you looked was cards and notes and letters from children all around the world um, to the men and women that were working at Ground Zero. And you could literally not be anywhere in the chapel without seeing one of these cards or letters, even in the bathrooms. Um, the lights were all off and, and it was just softly lit by candles, just hundreds of candles all over the chapel and fresh flowers everywhere. And there was the feeling of, um, of just a solemnness and very quietness and um, peace, amazingly peace. Um, there were men that were sleeping on the pews. There were um, people just walking around quietly. And we walked in and sat in the front and were sort of briefed on what was going on there. And, um, and then we just started working, helping in whatever way we could. I think it was in all of our hearts to be able to talk to the men and, and in some way comfort them, but the truth is, is there was just no words that could have expressed what was in our hearts. Um, for the first few hours, I walked around sort of aimlessly around the chapel trying to find things to do. And I ended up at the front um, near the altar on the floor and I had a huge pile of, of roses next to me and I was rearranging the vases and um, rearranging the flowers. And I began to hear um, a piano playing really softly. And there was a huge, a huge black grand Steinway piano at the front of the church, which had caught all of our attention when we walked in, but it was closed and the thought of anyone actually playing it in the silence of the chapel was 
sort of um, ridiculous. We were all sort of scared to touch the piano, but I think everybody sort of wanted to play it. So when I heard the piano playing, um, I instantly stood up and I, I looked over and I saw one of the girls on my team had been brave enough to open the, the piano up and begin to play. And, um, and I looked on the other side of the room and a fireman was just walking slowly towards her and he sat down next to her on the bench and um, he asked her to play a song and she began to play and they began to sing. And, um, and at that moment things became very, very real to me and the power of the words of the song, and despite all of, of the sorrow and pain and um, lack of understanding and confusion and hopelessness, um, that there was still such a steady stream of peace there that was just unexplainable. But through these words, there was a bridge. And ever since that night, the words to the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, were burned in my heart. When peace like a river attendeth my way When sorrow like sea billows roll Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say of this memorable crusade, there is one hymn above all others that's blessed our hearts, and you've written from the far corners of our land telling of its blessing to you too. Cliff Barrows and his wonderful choir join me in singing, How Great Thou Art.
Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul. does not know that great and well-loved hymn, Abide With Me. It's one of the cornerstones of English hymnody. It's sung in our country by crowds at football matches and on great occasions in cathedrals like Salisbury Cathedral behind me and at state funerals and royal funerals and at many an unremembered but much loved grave in an English country churchyard.
You may not know the story of the hymn. It was written by Henry Light, who was the vicar of a little fishing village, well, it was then a little fishing village, at Brixham in Devon. Light was born in Scotland and educated in Ireland and was then a minister in Cornwall before he moved to Devon. And it was while he was in Cornwall that he came in touch with the Cornish Methodists with their warm-hearted and extrovert love for Christ and their heartwarming personal faith in him as saviour. And I think Light's faith, which had perhaps been a bit stiff and formal up to then, began to change and he became a preacher and a witness for the eternal gospel. Henry Light had literary gifts, but failing health. He gave us other hymns, like the ever popular, Praise My Soul, The King of Heaven. But it's for Abide With Me that he's really remembered. Written at the end of his life when the shadows were closing round him, he died young. It's in the form of an invitation to the living Christ to come and make his home among us, as with those first disciples, and to be our personal friend and saviour. And it tells of his cross as the only real source of comfort, because it's through his cross that we find deliverance from our sins. And the hymn goes on to speak of Christ's victory over death and the promise of eternal life for all those who are united to him by faith. Do you remember the words, hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes, shine through the gloom and point me to the skies. Heaven's morning breaks and earth's vain shadows flee. In life, in death, O Lord, abide with me. From 1861 to 1869, the pastor of the Hanson Place Baptist Church was Dr. Robert Lowry, a respected scholar who later became a professor at Lewisburg College in Pennsylvania. The hope of heaven is truly a great hope for every child of God. The Apostle Paul told us that we did not have this hope we'd be the most miserable of all people. One of the well-known names in early gospel music is Robert Lowry. You perhaps recall some of his early songs, What Can Wash Away My Sin, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus, We're Marching to Zion, and perhaps his best well-known song, Shall We Gather at the River? Lowry tells the story one day back in 1864 while pastoring the Hanson Place Baptist Church in Brooklyn, New York, right in the midst of that terrible epidemic that was sweeping the area. He was exhausted, physically, emotionally, and as he was lying on his couch one day in a hot July afternoon, he began thinking about heaven. Lowry said, I saw the throne of God, and I saw that river coming out of the throne. I saw the saints of the ages gathered around the river, and my soul took on new life. Very shortly, Robert Lowry wrote these very triumphant words, 
Yes, we'll gather at the river, gather with the saints at the river that flows from the throne of God. According to Ira Sankey, the famous evangelist of his time, Dr. Lowry had also been asking why was it that hymn writers wrote so much about the river of death and so little about the pure water of life? Robert Lowry wrote the words of Shall We Gather at the River in just 15 minutes, and then he sat down at his parlor organ and worked out the tune. He described it rather disparagingly as brass band music and noted that although it was very popular, he himself didn't think much of it. It belongs to a whole genre of mid-19th century American gospel songs which are marvelously singable and which, although in a way they're very simple, have a kind of profundity and depth of faith. It became enormously popular. Lowry himself was rather embarrassed once to hear it being sung by a group of half-drunken lumberjacks on a train journey between Louisbourg and Harrisburg. And here in Scotland, Edwin Scrimger, who was the only British MP ever elected on a prohibitionist ticket when he unseated Winston Churchill in Dundee in 1922, announced that come prohibition, all the beer and spirits in the city would be tipped into the River Tay, whereupon the assembled crowd crowd promptly started singing, Shall We Gather at the River? In the 1860s, America fell prey to many serious epidemics. Typhus, smallpox, cholera, scarlet fever, and diphtheria. It was during one of these epidemics in Brooklyn, New York, in 1864, that Robert Lowry, troubled by so many houses in mourning, wrote, Shall We Gather at the River? According to the writings of E.W. Long, Dr. Lowry looked out his window at the Hudson River and wondered, Shall we meet again? We are parting at the river of death. Shall we meet at the river of life? So on that sultry afternoon, as he reflected on the death and grief the people of his city were suffering, Dr. Lowry wrote the words of this hymn based on the verse in the book of Revelations. And the angel showed me a pure river of life proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. He then sat down at the organ and composed the tune. This hymn touched many lives. A few years ago, Neil Young sang, It's better to burn out than it is to rust. Well, some 160 years earlier, similar words were spoken by the sickly English churchman, Henry Francis Light. When told to slow down his work to guard his health, Light often replied, It's better to wear out than to rust out. Light was born in 1793 and died of tuberculosis in 1847, but he achieved a lot in his short life. He won the Poetry Prize at university, published two books of poetry, and wrote many hymns. He spent the last 23 years of his life as the pastor of a small parish in the fishing village of Brixham, Devon. He was so devoted to his flock that people came to call him Mr. Greatheart. So influential was his legacy that 37 years after his death, this church was rebuilt and dedicated to his memory. Abide With Me was probably written in 1820 when Henry Light was just 27. And it was inspired by a visit he made to a dying friend who kept repeating the words, Abide With Me based, of course, on the words that the disciples said to the resurrected Jesus when they met him on the road to Emmaus, abide with us, for it is towards evening. And 25 years later, when Light himself knew that he was near to death, 
He took out the hymn that he'd written all those years ago from a drawer and he gave them to a relative and it was only sung for the first time after his death. Since then, of course, it's been a marvellous evening hymn. It's been very much used at funerals. And also here in Britain, it's been sung on the football terraces, particularly at the FA Cup final in Wembley Stadium. Abide With Me is one of those hymns which speaks to us because it talks of something that we can all feel, and that is the shortness of life and the instability of it. Light, who was a parish priest living by the sea, knew how much the sea entered into the hearts and the spirits of his parishioners, and so he uses the image here to write a prayer which speaks to their condition and to the condition of all of us. Speaking of our own instabilities, our own fears, our own needs and our own hopes. Do you remember? Hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes. Shine through the gloom and point me to the skies. Heaven's morning breaks and earth's vain shadows flee. In life, in death, O Lord, abide with me.
This is my 